So, got our bedazzled snops. Beautiful. Let's talk about Life is Strange. No, I'm not gonna start with the first one. Everyone already has opinions on the original. No, not the second one either. Today, you're here to watch a too long video about Life is Strange True Colors. If you've never played one of these games before, here's the basic experience. The main Life is Strange games are broken into five story chapters. The gameplay is similar to a point and click adventure, except you are moving around in a 3D space. The story is the main focus usually with occasional puzzles to keep it interesting. The main thing that distinguishes these games is that their protagonist will have some kind of power. In the first game, the protagonist Max Caulfield has the ability to turn back time. The second Life is Strange game I've never personally played, but the Wikipedia page says that one of the characters has telekinesis. In True Colors, our protagonist Alex Chen has magic empathy powers. She can see colored auras around people when they're feeling something particularly strong. The colors relate to which emotions they're feeling, blue for sadness, red for anger, and purple for fear. She can also focus on people when they have a glowing aura to read their mind. It feels like mind reading, but I think it works better if you think of it like giving context to the emotions that the characters are feeling. She can do something similar with objects as well, if an item is imbued with enough emotion, Alex can kind of hear that emotional echo. Another mechanic that we will see occasionally is texting. Like the original Life is Strange, Alex will sometimes receive text messages from characters within the story. This isn't gameplay so much as world building. You don't get to choose responses, just read what Alex sends. Also, like the original Life is Strange, our protagonist has a journal. She mainly uses it to write about her thoughts on the emotions that she's absorbed. The game also includes a social media app called MyBlock. It seems to be in, like a mix of Facebook and Nextdoor. I've spent literally hours waiting through the social media posts of NPCs and reading responses, and I think it adds a lot to building a believable world. I do think it's possible to play this game without interacting with text messages, MyBlock, or the journal, but why would you want to? I think these little world building touches are what really led me to fall in love with the game. And I was absolutely obsessed when I first played it. But also, I have some opinions on the ending. I'm gonna go through this game, explaining the plot and characters chapter by chapter. At the end, you can hear all my spicy or lukewarm takes. So with that in mind, we are doing full spoilers for True Color in this one. So if you care about spoilies and you haven't played the game, you're in luck. You can play it on Xbox Live. Just, just come back to me, okay? Please don't make YouTube be mean to me, it's my first video essay. Another whoopsie I want to bring up is that this game is really gorgeous, which you might not be able to tell from my game footage. I was a big dummy and I didn't check my settings before recording. So if chapters one and two look a little funky or have super shiny hair, that's my B, not the game's fault. Don't judge me, it's my first time. So let's get into it. We open on Alex speaking to someone named Dr. Lin, whom we never actually get to see. So Alex is leaving the Helping Hands group home to move in with her older brother Gabe in Haven Springs, Colorado. Dr. Lin obviously cares about Alex and wants her move to go as smoothly as possible. She asks if Gabe knows of her issues, and Alex says no. He doesn't know. No one will once I leave this place. I'll just be... A normal girl in a normal town. Now the game really begins. We immediately arrive in Haven Springs, and Alex is excited and nervous to reunite with Gabe, who she hasn't seen in eight years because they were separated in the foster care system. Gabe arrives, and we have our first choice. Do we give our long-lost brother a hug or a handshake? What kind of monster chooses handshake? Gabe is obviously so excited to see Alex and wants to introduce her to the rest of Haven Springs. He's made a home here and he's excited to have his sister be a part of it. Our first stop is the florist, Leith Flowers, so Gabe can buy a bouquet for his girlfriend Charlotte, who is mad at him for some unspecified reason. Huh. Leith. I wonder if that will come back later. At the flower shop, we meet Eleanor, the owner, who immediately welcomes Alex with a giant hug. And her granddaughter Riley, who greets us with... What's your greatest weakness? Uh, what? Riley is preparing for a college interview, and while her boyfriend Mac doesn't know about it yet, Gabe has been helping her get ready. There definitely seems to be some tension in Riley and Mac's relationship. We pick out some flowers and we're on our way. As Gabe and Alex walk to the Silver Dragon Dispensary to visit Charlotte, we can see a couple suspicious signs advertising an upcoming explosion from Typhon Mine Company. If you're paying attention to the dates in Universe, we know that this is actually scheduled for today. 
Uh, Typhon is going to have a pretty consistent presence in both Haven Springs and the story at large, but let's put a pin in them for now. Alex waits outside the dispensary while Gabe drops off the flowers. While he's inside, we meet Ethan, Charlotte's son. Alex and Ethan bond over comic books and how cool it would be to have a bangle of invisibility. Ethan gives Alex one of his homemade comics, Thanor the Monster Slayer, and after noticing a rope and a flashlight in his backpack, we learn that Ethan likes to explore the mines. So I'm sure that won't be important later. But before I can force my player character to stop this child from a horrible death, Alex decides to check out the record store. We get briefly introduced to our first love interest, Steph, but we won't really speak to her until later. She's working as a DJ inside the record store and gestures to us to pick the next song. Shortly after we meet our second love interest, Ryan, who is a Colorado State Park Ranger, here to pick up a recording of Bird Calls. Although he doesn't work here, he's able to help us find the hold list and purchase the record Gabe had on hold, Kings of Leon. He seems cool. For a tree cop. Before we can head on our way, Steph leaves the recording booth on her cell phone and is clearly angry about something. Alex starts taking on Steph's negative emotions, even tapping her foot the same way that Steph does. Ryan notices immediately and helps to kind of navigate the situation. Once Steph is out of the building and Alex has a chance to calm down, Gabe arrives looking for us and is excited we've gotten to know his best friend Ryan. Ryan lets Gabe know that Mac has been looking for him. Gabe seems annoyed, but not too concerned. We leave Ryan behind to watch the radio station and head over to our final stop. But on the way, Gabe gets to do the dad thing with Ethan, which basically just means checking in on him. Dad thing? No, 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 no. No, no, I'm better than a dad. I'm like dad plus. <laughs> The game gives us the opportunity to tell Gabe that Ethan is planning on exploring the mines. Now this isn't my first rodeo. Well, okay then. We leave Ethan to his horrible, deadly evening plans and finally make our way to the Black Lantern, the bar where Gabe works. We meet Jed, the owner of the bar and Gabe's boss. He's also Ryan's dad. Jed once again reminds both Gabe and us that Mac is on the warpath. Gabe shows us around his apartment above the Black Lantern, before basically giving it to Alex as her own space. Alex is excited to give Gabe the record she bought, but of course, he put it on hold to get for her. Well, I got it for you first, so I get the credit. Time to jam to some Kings of Leon. What kind of monster? In the middle of our sibling moment, Mac shows up at the door. He's angry, and Alex immediately feels it. Mac accuses Gabe of sleeping with Riley and punches him. Alex is getting overwhelmed with all of Mac's anger, and we finally get the first real taste of her powers. Alex becomes flooded with Mac's anger and becomes angry in a very similar way, punching Mac's lights out so hard I was legitimately terrified where the scene was going to go. The punching goes on just long enough to be extremely uncomfortable before Gabe pulls us off of Mac. In our wild anger, we take a swing at him too before we can calm down. Alex smacks Gabe in the face, but that knocks her out of her anger-fueled trance and brings her back to her senses. Mac leaves like a dog with a tail between his legs, and Alex tries to apologize, but Gabe doesn't really want to talk about it. He leaves to go to work, and we are left alone in his... our... apartment. Alex spends some time unpacking and explores the place thoroughly. We learn that Gabe has been searching for her for a long time, contacting all of her former foster homes. He's even been looking for their dad, who came to Haven Springs a while ago, but has likely left for some reason. Tracking their father is presumably how Gabe ended up here in the first place. Under the bed, we find a guitar with a note from Gabe. Alex is a little rusty, but excited to play, and we are treated to a lovely rendition of Creep by Radiohead, ending, of course, on the line, I don't belong here. When we're finished being a moody bitch, it's time to go downstairs to the Black Lantern Bar. We meet Charlotte, Ethan's mom, and Gabe's girlfriend, but unfortunately, we don't really have time to talk to her very much yet. Jed is without a bartender because Gabe and Ryan went to the ranger station for more first aid supplies. He asks if we want to help out temporarily. And Jed is a great boss, kind and easygoing. He even lets us drink. (laughs) Jed asks us to take care of some of the patrons in the bar and clean up some dirty dishes. We can do these in any order, but let's start with Steph. We can finally get a proper introduction to our second love interest. Steph is planning a LARP event in Denver, which is what that stressful phone call was about. I honestly thought it would be something a little bit more important, but I I get it, nerd shit is stressful. She also informs us that Jed is something of a town hero. He helped rescue a bunch of miners after the mine shaft collapsed, and as a reward, Typhon practically gave him the Black Lantern. But the most important thing we learn about is... Bedazzled Kiwi Snops! 
But as Old Kiwi Snops is an alcohol no one orders at the Black Lantern, so naturally it is being used as a punishment shot for losing the jukebox game. So let's play the jukebox game. You get to ask five questions about the song title, band name, and album cover, and using those questions, try to figure out which song Steph picked. Either way, someone gets a shot. But unfortunately, we can't stay here all day. Alex says goodbye and moves on to another table, where we meet two new citizens of Haven Springs, Ducky and Diane. I am Reginald McAllister the third, Ducky to friends. And Ducky is a big weirdo, and I love him. Diane works for Typhon and is still finding her place in Haven. We take their food orders and bring Ducky his special whiskey, which was in Gabe's, now Alex's, couch for some reason. And we take our second shot at work. To Miss Alex Chen, a most tenacious detective. To Alex. Cheers. When Alex goes to clear the dishes from a table, we run into Mac again, who is now afraid of us after we completely demolish his face. He actually kind of apologizes and asks Alex not to tell Riley about the incident. He wants to explain it to her himself. So when Riley arrives, we get the chance to tell her the truth about the incident, or to go with Mac's version. I was totally willing to give Mac the benefit of the doubt, but his story puts all the blame on Gabe, so I definitely was not going to allow it. <laughs> huh. After making our horrid decision, we run into Sheriff Pike, who makes a horribly inappropriate joke. I'm gonna have to take you and your brother in for questioning. <coughs> Your face. <laughs> you should see your face. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Thankfully, we read his mind later, we learn that he regrets his dumb joke, but you're on thin ice, mister. Once we finish all the duties Jed assigned us, Gabe arrives and wants to talk, so we head up to the roof. Things are tense for a second because of the punch, but Gabe is both understanding and forgiving. We have the opportunity to tell Gabe about our past or about our powers. If we tell him about our powers, he thinks it's really cool. If we tell Gabe about our past, he gives us a matchbook with only one match left. But let's put a pin in that for now. Alex is really struggling with finding a place to belong. Foster care is difficult for anyone, but Alex's power has made it especially fraught for her. She's really just looking for a safe, stable place to build a life and a home for herself. Gabe wants to help her get there. Our conversation is interrupted by Ryan, who can't seem to find Ethan anywhere. Uh-oh. Thankfully, we told Gabe where Ethan was heading, right? Oh dear. If Alex didn't tell Gabe about Ethan's adventure earlier, luckily she will now. The three of us head to the abandoned mines to look for him. Since there's a scheduled blast tonight, Gabe calls the safety team at Typhon to postpone the explosion. As we wander around looking for Ethan, Alex notices that the scenery looks a lot like the comic book Ethan made. Using the comic book, they are able to retrace Ethan's steps to find out where he went. Ethan somehow manages to get himself on the opposite end of a chasm from our main character, with only a log branching the gap. Ryan, our fearless forest ranger, tries to walk across, but the log shifts, and we are told that the boys are too heavy to cross. Ethan's fear is so strong, Alex is afraid she'll lose herself to it like she did with Mac, but she is forced to come to terms with her fear and offers to cross the log herself. Ryan pulls out a rope from his bag and instructs Gabe to act as a belay. One end of the rope is tied around Alex's waist and the other around Gabe's. If we fall, Gabe can use the rope to pull us back to safety. Now, given all the pieces set up so far, and the description of the game given when you purchase it, I'm certain the more observant viewers probably already know where this is all going to go. But, we make it across the log and try to convince Ethan to follow us. But he's distraught and won't listen to Alex. We have to use our powers again, but this time in a very different way. Instead of the emotions taking over completely, Alex can sort of allow herself to dip into the minds of people with particularly strong emotions and sort of see the world the way they see it. When we are in their emotions this way, we can interact with objects and see the emotions attached to them, but this time from someone else's point of view. Using this power, we are able to see that Ethan is scared of some kind of monster that appears in his favorite comic books. When we are in his head, we can see the eyes of the creature peeking at us from the chasm, and it's legitimately tense. Because we know what Ethan is scared of, we can convince him that we have a bangle of invisibility, making the monster unable to see us, and him if he holds our hand. As we walk Ethan across the log, we get kind of a cool effect of the camera forcing us to look down at the monster. You have to manually slowly move the camera back up to look ahead, and it's kind of a cool effect that adds to the vibe of this whole scene. We make it across the log and are finally safe. Or so it seems. There's barely enough time to catch our breath before the sirens go off, followed by an explosion.
The explosion shakes the ground and knocks the log off the chasm we've just finished crossing. Boulders roll down the mountain with the tremors, and one of them knocks Gabe directly into the chasm. Since we are still tied to him, Alex feels the tug on the rope and tries to pull him back up. Ryan helps us briefly before looking back and seeing more rocks about to pummel us. Being the Boy Scout forest ranger he is, he pulls out his knife and cuts the rope. Gabe presumably falls to his death, and Alex, Ryan, and Ethan are left to mourn him. We open a few days after the events of Chapter 1 at Gabe's wake in the Black Lantern. There's snippets of a lot of characters giving eulogies, which are honestly kind of heartbreaking. Tensions are definitely high, and Ryan is upset when someone refers to his death as a senseless accident. It wasn't an accident. Son, now is not the time. Gabe called the mine. I gave him my sat phone to be sure he could get through. They fucked up. And now, now Gabe's dead. He kind of has a point, though. We saw Gabe call Typhon about postponing the blast, so it's pretty weird that it went off. Max says that he was the safety officer on duty that night and he never got a call, basically calling Ryan a liar. Ryan obviously doesn't react well to that and it escalates. It gets to be too much and Alex escapes upstairs to her apartment. Steph follows to comfort us. Finally, a Steph scene. It's been a while. <laughs> I put take a shot in my script, so I guess I gotta take a shot. We have some awkward flirty convo, and when Steph sees Alex's guitar, she's very excited to jam together. Steph plays drums. I can't remember if I mentioned that before. When in the record store earlier, if you explore around, you can find her drum kit in the corner. Since this used to be Gabe's apartment, and Steph and Gabe were friends, she has a lot of memories of the place. When she sees a whiskey bottle on the mantle with the words foosball champion scrawled on it, she gets kind of sad and withdrawn. So it's time to use our magical empathy powers once more. We dive right into Steph's sadness and examine objects in Gabe's apartment connected to it to learn more about their relationship. Through this, we learn that Steph had planned on leaving Haven Springs to look for her fortune out in the world. She wanted to go to Denver and play music. Gabe, of course, didn't want his friend to leave, so he challenged her to a foosball match. If he won, Steph had to stay in Haven a little longer. He obviously won, but it's implied that Steph let him win, so maybe she wasn't quite ready to leave. But seeing his makeshift winner trophy directly after the wake had set off the sadness, making it strong enough for Alex to interact with. Alex wonders, could she help Steph the way she helped Ethan? So Alex eggs Steph on, trying to get her to play foosball. She agrees, reluctantly at first, and we play some foosball. On my controller, you move each foosball stick separately with the trigger and the bumper buttons, which was a little confusing at first, but once you get the hang of it, it's a pretty fun minigame. As you play, Steph will begin to ask you questions to try and distract you. They start small, like asking your favorite band, but lead to questions like... Hey, so are you into girls or what? By playing foosball, we help distract Steph and make her feel better. But eventually, she has to go to work at the record store, and we're left alone in Gabe's, our, apartment. When we make our way down to the Black Lantern, Jed says the apartment is officially Alex's now, and he won't be taking rent from us, at least not for a little while. Alex wants to find Mac and interrogate him about what happened the night of Gabe's death, but Jed warns her. Just don't pin all your hopes on Mac Loudon. He also tells us that Charlotte wants to talk to us at the dispensary. To add on to our to-do list, Steph texts us asking that we stop by the record store, and Ryan texts us wanting to talk about the night of Gabe's death. So when we venture out into the more open sections of this chapter, we have a lot of options. I think theoretically the only thing you have to do is talk to Mac, but where's the fun in that? Haven Springs isn't really that big, but there are some areas we can explore. And as we start to play more, you'll begin to recognize some of the NPC backgrounds, like city characters. Most of them don't have names in the overworld, like you won't see their name printed above their head. They're just kind of given little nicknames, like Hoodie Guy or Ice Cream Man. But if you pay attention, you can match them up with their names on my block, except for Jelly Bean Lady. She's just Jelly Bean Lady in all aspects of her life. If we read the emotions of some Typhon workers, we can see that they're nervous about their job security after the incident with Gabe. Typhon isn't communicating with them, and some of them are pretty angry about it. We can also help a birdwatcher find a hawk. She really wants to beat Ryan in the birdwatching competition. When we make our way to the dispensary to visit Charlotte, Diane is just leaving. She tells Alex that she's sorry for her loss, etc., etc. It's very polite and sterile. Once in the dispensary, there's a lot of weed jokes. Glass pipes are so cool. They're like works of art. 
that can also get you high. Charlotte wanted to talk with Alex because she has been asked to sign an affidavit from Typhon surrounding the circumstances of Gabe's death. They will give her a lot of money, but she can't talk about Gabe's death or the possibility that Typhon had something to do with it. This is the first actually important choice in the game. At least, I think it's the first choice that has any direct impact on the ending. So you can advise Charlotte to either sign or ignore it. We really aren't going to get a fallout from this decision until much later, so let's go to the record store to meet Steph. On our way there, we meet who I will call Anger Management Guy. Yikes. Once inside the record store, we meet Hoodie Guy. Hoodie Guy was actually the first NPC character I was able to name on my block. It's Hector. If we read Hector's emotions, he's sad that Chrissy left him, and he seems to be browsing the heartbreak section of the record store. So we obviously assume that Chrissy broke up with him, but if we check the notice board, we learn that Chrissy is his lost dog, and we can help reunite them. Steph is in the recording booth, but has time to chat for a moment. The LARP that was going to happen in Denver was cancelled due to Gabe's death, but as a fun distraction for Ethan, she wants to plan a special LARP for him here in Haven. We get to pick which monster we want as the big bad for this adventure, and Steph sends us to her notebook to fill out a character sheet. We make it into the flower shop to ask Eleanor about Mac, and she tells us to check the bridge. Alex turns to leave, but senses that Eleanor is suddenly full of fear. If we pry deeper, we learn that she's troubled by brain fog. She's obviously having a hard time remembering things and is dealing with the beginning of Alzheimer's. She's scared of Riley finding out and choosing to stay in Haven with her instead of going to college, so we help her remember what she was doing and realize she has forgotten about Gabe's death and wake. This is the second truly important decision and will affect some choices down the road and the ending. Do we tell Eleanor about Gabe's death or do we leave her in blissful ignorance? Alex makes her choice, and we leave to go find Mac. He's hanging out on the bridge near the flower shop. We could try to question him about Gabe's phone call and his shift as safety manager, but he clams up and won't talk. We have to find some way to push him over the edge. I just need to find something I could use to push him over the edge. Which is wild terminology when they're standing on the edge of a bridge. We find Riley, who tells us that Mac has been acting weird and asked her to run away with him after the wake. Alex finds it odd that Mac is running away if he isn't lying about the phone call and did nothing wrong. Now that we have that negative info, we can try to interrogate Mac again. The game warns us to finish up our business before we talk to him, so it is possible to miss helping Steph set up the LARP or advising Charlotte about the affidavit. So now we can push him over the edge and we are able to access his fear. Mac is paranoid that Typhon is watching him and controlling all of Haven Springs. We chase him through the street before eventually confronting him and learning the truth. Mac did in fact receive Gabe's call and contacted his superior to postpone the blast. They ignored him and went through with the blast anyway, but he doesn't know why. Later, Typhon threatened him to lie and say he never got the call at all. At this point, the game gives us the choice to help Mac deal with his obvious incapacitating fear or not help him. (laughs) This basically means deciding whether you say nice things to him or just blame him for Gabe's death explicitly. What kind of monster? After we finish with Mac, it's time to meet Ryan. We find him in the mountains, presumably near where Gabe died. He's angry and upset about his involvement in the death. He blames himself for cutting the rope, and being a forest ranger, he feels it was his job to save everybody. We offer him forgiveness and help him calm down. Part of the reason we wanted to talk to Ryan was to tell him what we learned from Mac about Typhon. He asks us how we know all this, and Alex actually tells him about her powers. She does a little demonstration with him, reading his negative emotions, but is surprised when his aura changes to a color we haven't seen before. Gold. Ryan, remembering a funny moment with Gabe and a goose. What is it with Ryan and birds? Ryan is experiencing joy. And Alex can tap into that too and sort of relive those memories with him. Depending on our choice earlier with Gabe and if we decided to tell him about our powers or not, Alex will either remark that Ryan is the first person she'd ever told or the first person other than Gabe. Ryan says that our powers can be used to take down Typhon, and he wants to help. Alex agrees, and then we can choose to either hug him or shove him so far into the friend zone he will never recover. Okay then. Team up. Do the buddy cop thing. (laughs) You're a loose cannon, Jen, but you get results. Chapter 2 ends with a sort of memorial service. The whole town stands on the bridge at night with paper lanterns, and we get a line that I think may be the heart of the game. He told me that home isn't something you find. 
is something you build. As we watch the lanterns fly into the sky, the town all glows a happy gold. All except Diane, whose primary emotion is fear. Chapter 3 begins several weeks after the events of Chapter 2. We open on Alex and Ryan telling Steph about Alex's powers while sitting at the Black Lantern. Alex has been officially hired there to take Gabe's place, and she and Ryan have been brainstorming ideas of how to take Typhon down. Steph doesn't believe her at first, but we convince her eventually. The current plan is to wait for Diane to come into the bar and see if Alex can read her mind, or emotions, and find a way to get any important information out of her. Alex works her shift at the bar for a while as we wait for Diane to arrive. We can help a student by playing a song that was stuck in her head or give a pep talk to a jogger lady. Depending on if you helped the bird watcher in the previous chapter, she will be ecstatic that she beat Ryan or cursing him for winning another year in a row. Drink for Ryan and birds. We chat with Charlotte about Ethan and the upcoming LARP, which is apparently later today. If you aren't paying attention to dates in universe or the dates attached to your text messages, it can be easy to miss that there's a bit of time between chapters 2 and 3. Once we finish enough things in the bar, Diane will enter, and we talk with our friend slash love interest to come up with a plan to get information from her. Steph wants to distract Diane by hitting on her while I search her bag for evidence. Oh my god, please tell me you have something better. I do. Oh good. Now to be clear, it's the same plan. Except, I'm the distraction. So basically, we are asked to pick the hottest distraction. Whoever you choose is who you gain points with. I was trying to play crazy 3D chess, like, oh, if I set stuff up with Diane, then Ryan will be free for me. But no, I was just overthinking it. <laughs> anyway, you pick your distraction, but tell them that you're going to try to get information on your own first, and you'll text them for backup if needed. You serve Diane her drink and awkwardly sit across from her. It's kind of weird. You start asking her questions, trying to push a specific emotion to the front. You can make her feel either angry at Typhon for putting her in the middle of the situation, or make her feel sad about her potential involvement in Gabe's death. And honestly, Alex really goes for the jugular either way to make Diane really feel one of these emotions. Once we do, we can see that she is keeping something that incriminates Typhon on a USB in her bag. But we are eventually forced to call in our distraction that we picked earlier. Steph is incredibly forward, and Ryan is incredibly awkward. Either way, they string Diane along just enough for Alex to steal the USB, and then they completely fumble the dismount. Get back to me. I'm not going anywhere. See ya. The three of you run upstairs and laugh in that, like, excited friend way that happens sometimes when you do something just a little crazy. For the first time, these characters feel like a real trio of friends. We try to use the USB, but it's encrypted. Good thing Riley is a computer whiz. Ryan leaves to drop the USB off with her, but now it's abruptly time for the LARP. We find our special bard hat and our guitar. If you did not receive the matchbook in chapter one from Gabe directly, then you will find it when you are searching for the bard hat. Then we need to gather and read up on both our character sheet and Ethan's. Next to these character sheets, we can find Gabe's make shit right list, which sadly includes the lines, find Alex, which is scratched off, and forgive dad. <laughs> Steph texts us in a panic that Ethan doesn't want to do the LARP anymore, so we need to talk him into it. Ethan is obviously pretty emotionally distraught. He's worried that he won't be able to be happy while playing, and that if he doesn't seem like he's having enough fun, that he will be disappointing a lot of people. Pretty complicated emotional stuff, honestly. We encourage him to feel his feelings and not to hide or feel like he has to pretend for other people. He can try the LARP, and if he isn't having fun, he doesn't have to pretend. The next big chunk of the game is a really cute little RPG-style section. The best part is seeing all the townspeople in different character roles for the LARP. Jen, as King Tavor, tells us to go on an adventure to find three soul gems. I don't want to go too deep into the story and the lore of this little LARP, mainly because it doesn't really apply to the main story or the plot, but the important thing to note is that much of the town main characters and notable NPCs are involved. And watching them play their roles is honestly, you know, one of my favorite parts of the game. <laughs> Ducky is playing a weird little gnome and a bloodied up black lantern. And outside the bar, there's a jester with a riddle for us that we may know better as writer boyfriend and Steph's co-worker. During the LARP gameplay, we will face off with Ryan three times with him playing three different roles. A wolf, a snake, and a troll. 
The game has very basic RPG mechanics, so you can choose attacks and abilities to harm your enemies. <laughs> If you chose Ryan as the hottest distraction, you can read his mind and get this scene. Oh, I must look like such a goofball. So much for being hot. Hot and goofball are not mutually exclusive. <laughs> At least in my book. This scene showed up in my first playthrough and I became instantly Team Ryan for life. I know, I know. Choosing the male option in a Life is Strange game seems weird and I seem to be the minority. <laughs> Steph is obviously our game master, but she also takes on the role of a sorceress or a magic store proprietress. While in the middle of the LARP, we can make a pit stop to visit Riley at Leith Flowers to inquire about the USB. Depending on our choices earlier in the game, Riley may have already learned about Eleanor's Alzheimer's. I think if we tell Eleanor about Gabe's funeral, she's able to lie to Riley better and hide it from her, but I'm not 100% on that. She's working on the flash drive, but it isn't ready yet, and we also learn that Mac has left town. But we can't waste too much time, Ethan is still waiting for us to finish the LARP. We get the final gem when we encounter Ryan as a troll. If we manage to pick up the troll powder from the sorceress, we don't even have to fight him. We force him to say nice things instead. See deep into the hearts of people. But you don't let that stop you from believing in them. This troll is emo. We finish gathering our gems and meet Charlotte, dressed as a forest spirit who gives Ethan slash Thanor his special magic sword that the jewels slot into. King Tabor, played by Jed, ends up being the evil villain, and we have a final battle. We are experiencing this through Ethan's imagination, so it's more magical and colorful. We defeat the villain and celebrate with Ethan. He looks about as happy as he possibly could be, when suddenly we hear the Typhon siren. He immediately crumbles in on himself and his fantasy shatters. Ethan glows purple and we can see his PTSD fear response. And the scene ends there. We jump to later that day outside the dispensary. Alex goes in to meet Charlotte in her studio. The middle is dominated by a slab of marble partially carved. Charlotte thanks Alex for helping Ethan earlier and confirms he has left to spend time with his dad. Charlotte is vulnerable and Alex wants to help, but she's pretty pushy about it. And Charlotte eventually explodes on her, knocking the marble off the table, shattering it. We enter her anger to help like we have before. Charlotte's absolutely overwhelmed. She's angry at Gabe for dying and leaving her alone. She's angry at Ryan for not being able to save Gabe. And she's angry at Alex because her arrival has been the start of so much chaos and hurt. But most of all, she's angry at Ethan for disobeying and causing the events that led to Gabe's death. And Charlotte is really guilty about feeling this way. We get another big choice here, kind of an extension of our powers. Should we try to take her anger away from her? We make our choice and say goodbye, heading back to the apartment. Riley has finished with the drive, and Steph and Ryan are waiting for Alex to go through it. It's filled with call logs, including the one from Gabe where he spoke to Mac about postponing the blast. We also hear other call logs confirming that Mac told his superiors about Ethan as well. Now, if we chose to take Charlotte's anger in the last scene, Alex will explode with her own anger when she learns that Typhon willfully endangered all their lives. She grabs the foosball trophy and throws it at the wall, smashing it and screaming into the heavens. Steph is angry and leaves, with Ryan trailing awkwardly behind her. Left alone, Alex is forced to continue the investigation without their help. If you don't take Charlotte's anger, your Scooby gang will stick around with you for the next bit. We investigate call logs and emails to learn that Diane clearly has a lot of emotional turmoil about her part in all of this, but she went along with it anyway. I think the worst part was hearing her respond to reporters that if only they had called the emergency line, the accident could have been prevented, which is just an outright lie. Typhon also seems incredibly confident that they'll be expanding their operations in Haven Springs. Diane's supervisor advised her to push this under the rug, and that's what she did. If you postpone tonight's scheduled blast, you put Rhea in jeopardy. That puts the whole company in jeopardy. Is that what you want? So what is Rhea? Rhea is a second blast scheduled to go off at the same time as the original explosion in a decommissioned coal mine. The coal mine was due for inspections of some kind, so presumably Rhea was set off to cover something up. We also find dossiers on the Haven Springs City Council members, such as Jed, Eleanor, and Ducky. The dossiers are actually a little creepy to me. Typhon has clearly been keeping tabs on people, and we get that even clearer when we find out that a private investigator was hired to watch Mac and to get dirt on him so that they can pressure him into lying. 
So with all of that, Alex decides she needs to give the flash drive to Deputy Pike to take down Typhon, and Chapter 3 ends. Do you like games where you dig girls? Do you like mysteries? You probably do, since you made it this far into the video. Did you know I made a game? It's called Camp Palette, and it's a lesbian dating sim style visual novel with a mystery to unravel. Play as Jess, a high school senior attending summer camp for the first time. Luckily, there are cuties ready to get to know you. There's Nat, a non-binary eccentric obsessed with Bigfoot. Cassie, a photographer with a touch of anxiety. Amy, an athletic flirt. And Bianca, a mysterious goth. If you're watching this the week it comes out, Camp Palette is 50% off. Check it out on Steam and find the link below. Chapter 4 takes place the same evening as Chapter 3, and is also the night of the Spring Festival. Alex collects the USB to give to Deputy Pike, but I guess it isn't time for that yet because she's going to go to the festival first. All the fun characters we have met so far are hanging out and we can do some fun festival activities. Like helping our good pal Hector win the jelly bean counting contest. Jed is hanging in a group and telling a long-winded story. We can chat with Eleanor and find out she has kind of a wild sense of humor. Body shots? Who's going first? Depending on if Riley finds out about Eleanor's Alzheimer's, she may have already decided not to go to college and is spending time alone at home instead of at the festival. If she didn't find out earlier, she'll be waiting for the bus to go to university. Alex can go and speak with her and tell her about Eleanor's Alzheimer's then and there. If she does, Riley will choose to stay behind. While we are out there, we can interact with more of the town's NPCs. Hey! Boot! Fuck you! You're just a goddamn tool for the man! You're a cog in the machine, you metal fuck! We wander back to the main festival, where Ryan is setting up lights and sound for the stage, and staff is DJing from a trailer. Part of the tradition of the festival is for ladies to give a rose to someone they're interested in. Alex can choose to give a rose to Ryan or Steph, or choose not to give a rose at all. Whoever we choose asks to meet us on our roof later. Steph says it's time for the music performance, and Alex finds out with dismay that she and Steph are the band performing tonight. As a musician myself, if Steph did that to me, I would be very pissed. It's fine though, because Alex's singing voice is MXM tune, so she sings Blister in the Sun like a champ. After the show, we talk with Charlotte. If you took her anger previously, she now feels empty and lost. If you don't take her anger, she apologizes for being horrible to Alex. She's still sad and angry, but Charlotte's slowly healing. After the Spring Festival, Alex heads back to the Black Lantern. We can make a quick stop in the bar to talk to Ducky. He's sad, so we help him out a bit. His wife, Tabby, died a few years ago, and he always feels sad around the Spring Festival. Alex dances with him to music from the jukebox until he feels better and goes back to the festival. Then we meet our chosen love interest on the roof. If it's Steph, she immediately tells us she's leaving Haven, which seems like a weird way to start this relationship. She wants to travel and play music and asks us to choose from three postcards to decide her location. Once we choose, Steph asks us to go with her. She's vague on the details, but she wants to play music with Alex, and she wants to leave Haven. She doesn't demand an answer right away, but we have the option to kiss or hug her, and we have a... joy explosion. If we meet Ryan, he plants a tree in Alex's roof garden and compliments her performance. You know they're going to make you do it again next year, right? But Alex hasn't ever really considered her future. Ryan helps her imagine what her life in Haven Springs could be like. And it ends once again in a kiss or a hug and another joy explosion. But we don't have too much time to dwell on this because we have to meet Pike. We tell him about the evidence on the USB and he takes Alex down to the station. Pike refuses to look at the evidence and says the case has been officially closed. Diane has threatened to sue us for stealing the USB from her purse but she's offering a deal to Alex. Basically, she won't sue if we sign something saying that we'll shut up about what we learned. Pike is obviously scared and pushes us to sign. See for yourself. Shit. What could be in that envelope? Someone's been watching our Scooby gang. If we push, Pike shows us pictures of Alex, Steph, and Ryan. 
Typhon has presumably hired a private investigator to watch us. We get another important choice. Do we sign the document or do we take Pike's fear away? If you choose to take Pike's fear, he lets you go without signing. But when you get back home, Alex will have a panic attack of sorts and is scared people are still watching her. If you sign the documents, we'll feel the effect of that later. Alex changes into some more comfortable clothes and goes downstairs to the bar to talk with Jed. He's trying to get Alex to trust him. He wants to help. So, Alex tells him. Typhon is covering up Gabe's death and has been watching the three of them. Jed seems to have already known that they were involved. Tell me. I'll do one better. I'll show you. Now, anyone versed in foreshadowing may have a pretty good idea of what's going to happen next. Jed takes Alex up to an old ventilation shaft to show her the evidence. Jed, why are you sad? Jed pulls a gun and shoots Alex in the shoulder, the blast throwing her down the ventilation shaft. We wake up in Dr. Lin's office, you know, like from the beginning of the game, and she asks us what we learned in Haven Springs. We chat with her a bit before she hits us with, If that were true, Alex, you'd know you were talking to an empty chair. So now we go through a weird, surreal escape the room section to try to leave Dr. Lin's office. When we finally escape, Alex wakes up in the middle of the ventilation shaft. It's dark, she's beat up and bloody. She's lying on a board across part of the shaft, stopping her descent partway. So basically, we've been hallucinating, and it's only going to get worse. When Alex tries to get herself unstuck, she falls deeper down, and we're thrown into a different hallucination. We are transported to a hospital, and Gabe is next to us. You are 10, I am 14. Our mother is sick. So is our father. But it's a different kind of sickness. Play your part. Alex plays through her version of her memories. She talks with her mom, but there's a weird skip in there. Gabe's ghost arrives to tell us we didn't remember it right, and we start at the beginning of the scene again. We play out the scene once more and get to our mom. She tells Alex how strong she is, and she wants Alex to take care of Gabe and her dad when she's gone. Alex clearly took this advice to heart. She's definitely internalized the idea that her family is her responsibility. During this scene, her mother also gives her a locket. At the end of this scene, we are transported to a new memory. We're in a rundown apartment with mattresses on the floor. Gabe's ghost tells us that. You're 11, I'm almost 15. Dad and I are time bombs. You keep running back and forth trying to defuse us both. This is going to suck so bad. Alex plays music while Gabe and their father fight, but when it's all over, Gabe tells us that we've misremembered again, so we start the scene over. This time we can explore the apartment a little bit more and get some insight into their life after their mom died. We learn Alex did most of the cooking, Gabe rarely went to school, and that Gabe and their dad fight enough that CPS has already been by and left her card. The fight continues and moves from outside the house to inside. During this fight, their dad accidentally hurts Alex, and in a moment of panic and regret, he leaves. For good. In her desperation, Alex throws the locket she received from her mother at her father, and he takes it with him, leaving his children behind. Our next memory is inside a group home. Gabe doesn't know this part. Apparently, at this point, he had already stolen a car and got sent to juvie, separating the siblings until they reunite at the beginning of the game. We can wander around the space and learn more about how hard a time Alex had in the system. She was put on a long list of different drugs and has unopened and returned letters from her father papering the ceiling of her bunk. Alex doesn't want to keep confronting the past, but Gabe's ghost says she has to. Alex suffered a lot in group homes and foster homes. Potential fosters or adoptive parents all deny her because of her troubled past. It seems to be implied that her emotion superpowers didn't start developing until the group home. But the group home is a pretty bad place to start adopting the emotions of others. Now it sort of makes sense to me why she hasn't experienced joy with her powers until Ryan. Alex is feeling hurt and abandoned. She takes the splintering of her family as a personal failing. Luckily, Gabe Ghost is there to talk her out of it. 
Essentially, Gabe tries to help her understand that none of this is her fault and she deserves a happy life. Alex wakes up from her hallucination once again at the bottom of the ventilation shaft. It's dark and she's terrified. She comes across a lantern but needs to find a way to light it. Thankfully, we have that book of matches with just one match left that was either given to us by Gabe in chapter one or Alex found in chapter three when looking for her bard hat. Alex uses the match and lights the lantern. It feels like a good cathartic moment. Her brother helps her emotionally through the hallucinations, but also literally by leaving the match behind for her. Unfortunately, it doesn't last very long. Alex falls into real despair for a moment before realizing she can sense a very strong emotion. She's able to follow this anger to its source. Alex limps along and we learn a few key things. When Jed saved those coal miners all those years ago, he was advised to abort the mission because it was too dangerous. Jed is just too prideful to stop. He puts his men in a dangerous situation and it goes wrong. Jed is able to save a lot of men, but some he is forced to leave behind, and one of those men who died was Alex's father. We get confirmation on this when we come across the object that is causing the anger, the locket from our earlier flashbacks. From here, Alex is able to escape the mine. We cut to the city council meeting at the Black Lantern. Diane is giving a very curated corporate speech, basically trying to get them to vote for Typhon expanding their business in Haven Springs. Alex walks right in, still covered in blood and limping. Remember, this girl has been shot. Ryan and Steph are rightly concerned about her, but she brushes them off to confront Jed directly. Alex says that Jed did this to her, and Typhon was responsible for Gabe's death. Diane will try to corporate speak around you, and you can bring up either her anger or sadness, depending on which way you prodded her earlier. Other council members can stand up for you now, depending on your previous actions. If you're generally nice to Ducky, helping him find his special whiskey and cheering him up at the Spring Festival, he'll be on your side. Eleanor will only help you if you are able to successfully hide her Alzheimer's from Riley. Charlotte is a little more complicated. She possibly signed a legal document at your advice that she wouldn't say anything against Typhon, but even if she did, she may still side with you if you didn't choose to take her anger. Diane will force her to stand down if she signed the affidavit, but she's still on your side. If you did take her anger, she doesn't feel strongly enough to help. She feels Alex took something important from her. But it doesn't really matter what the opinions of the city council are, because Alex basically goes Super Saiyan and just sort of forces a confession out of Jed. It's overly dramatic and very weird and just kind of way too long. Also way too many close-ups of their face. Jeez. At the end of all this, we can choose to either condemn Jed or forgive him. What's the difference? No idea. Vibes, I guess. We skip a few days later. Alex is obviously healed from her injuries. Didn't she get shot? Your chosen love interest arrives. If you've been wooing Step, she says she doesn't care if she stays in Haven or leaves. She only wants to be with Alex and will do whatever Alex wants. If you've been wooing Ryan, he will come visit you, regardless of whether or not he sided with you against his father. If he sided against you, he apologizes and we have a chance to forgive him or not. Either way, he tells her he's all in, here or anywhere else, if Alex wants him. Our love interest leaves and we have a final conversation with Ghost Gabe on the roof. He gives a lot of possible options for Alex's future, but it really boils down to this. Does Alex want to stay in Haven Springs, working at either the Black Lantern or the record store? Or does she want to leave, travel the world, and perform music? You see your choice play out? And that's the game! In Chapter 1, Alex asks Gabe what Typhon is mining in Haven Springs. He says they are currently mining uranium, but that they used to mine silver. But if we look at the Typhon documents on the USB, we learn that the decommissioned mine is actually a coal mine. Ding! I I'm just kidding, I'm not going to do that the whole time. In Chapter 3, we see a list of tasks on the fridge for how to take down Typhon, and Steph's name is on that list. But since Alex only just told Steph about her powers that morning, this is either a mistake, or it implies that Steph has been working on taking down Typhon with Alex and Ryan for several weeks without Alex telling her about the powers. And honestly, I think that's weirder. The jukebox game in chapter one only has one answer. This one's a real bummer to me because I think the jukebox game could have been a great replayable mini game. But once you know the answer, it's over. It's the same every time. It's not that big of a deal, but it does feel like a missed opportunity. In chapter two, there is a really weird transition that I think ruins the pace and emotionality. In fact, let me show it to you. 
What the fuck did you just say? Ryan, back off. Oh, hell. I'm just saying. I thought I heard that you Mac, were the one. You shut the hell up. No. No, go ahead. You got something to say, Mac? Let's fucking hear Come it. Come on, guys. Don't make me intervene. All right. Fine. As long as we're tossing around accusations, way I hear it, you're the guy who cut the rope. Why not you? That's it. Wait's over. Everyone out. <sighs> the loading screen lasts just a second too long. I've played this game several times, and every time I reach this moment, I'm always confused. Like the rug was pulled out from under me. I wish we could have finished the thought before the loading screen, because it's such a character and plot-focused conversation. Last little complaint I want to talk about here are the facial expressions on the characters. I've played this game so many times and spent so long editing the footage that these facial expressions don't even phase me anymore. But I remember when I first played, some of the facial movements made me feel uncomfortable. I don't know how to explain it, just something about the smiles sometimes just don't feel right. Obviously, the game is gorgeous. When I'm not ruining footage with my incompetence, anyway. There's a lot of small moments in the game that Alex can sit and reflect, and we see some B-roll of Haven Springs. The music is also amazing, but I can't really show you any of it because of YouTube's whole deal. MXM Tune is the singing voice of Alex, and I enjoy her music outside of the game, too. Another thing I like is what I'm going to call the Life is Strange cringe factor. If you haven't played the original Life is Strange game, it got a lot of criticism for having cringy and edgy dialogue. But I know that I am not alone in saying that I kind of love some of the cringier writing. Characters in True Color are a little older than the characters in the original Life is Strange, so I think that lessens the cringe factor dramatically. But we still get plenty of cringeworthy lines. Just thinking about you as the Hobbs to Ethan's Calvin. Exactly! That's exactly what it's like! Except you're, you know, dating his mom. <laughs> Clearly you haven't read my Calvin and Hobbes fan fiction. Haven Springs feels like a real city to me, and I love how the game builds the town and the people who live in it up. The setting is more intimate than the original Life is Strange, so much so that I'm convinced I can name every single NPC found in the game by cross-referencing their MyBlock profile. Which reminds me, there are so many interesting things to be found by diving deep into MyBlock. My favorite discovery was learning that Charlotte had posted asking for recommendations of a place for Ethan to practice parkour. Apparently, he had been practicing parkour when he visited his dad, and knowing that Ethan has been taking parkour lessons really explains how he is able to make the crazy jump that we see outlined in his Thanor comic when we're following his tracks in Chapter 1. The LARP, while not all that important to the plot of the game, really allows for some fun world and character building. I really love seeing who's a good actor and who isn't. It ranges from this... More than just talk, are you? Perhaps the magpie can help you on your quest. Step inside if your heart is true. Bah, what a thankless life, being a smith in the age of monsters. Whoa, he's really into this. To this. Behold, my love has been slain by yonder river monster. Where? Just down the yonder alley, near the river. Alas, alas. It's not just the NPCs though. I find most, if not all the characters in this game fascinating. Because it's a small town, all these characters already have relationships with each other and it's compelling to watch them interact. One weird thing I noticed was that Gabe doesn't interact with presumably his closest people before his death. We don't see Gabe and Charlotte together as a couple and we don't see Steph and Gabe together either. There's so much happening in chapter one that needs to be set up. So I understand why we don't see these characters interact, but I wish we could see those relationships in real time instead of being told about them after his death. Even Ryan, who Gabe introduces to us as his best friend, doesn't get any meaningful screen time with him to develop their relationship. Which brings me to my next point, Ryan. I like Ryan a lot. As a bisexual married to a man, I often find myself trying to express my bisexuality by dating women in games, especially with the Life is Strange games, which a lot of people think of as a lesbian game, given that Chloe and Max seem to be the canon relationship. So when I realized more people kissed Warren than Ryan, I was surprised and confused. But I will be returning to the love interest conversation later. It has its own section. I think the game has a lot of foreshadowing that I love to look back on, especially the things set up in chapter one. 
Leith Flowers is obviously named after the River Leith, often remembered as the River of Forgetfulness. This is definitely foreshadowing Eleanor's struggle with Alzheimer's. We also see a notice from Typhon around town foreshadowing the later blast that will go off. And Jed is foreshadowed as the villain in Chapter 3, when his LARP character turns out to be the secret bad guy. And speaking of the ending... The ending confuses me. I've played this game at least four times by now, and I'm still not 100% sure what Jed's involvement was in Gabe's death. We know that 12 years ago, Jed was in charge of a dig site and made a bad call that resulted in the mine flooding. But I don't think we know enough about the situation to say exactly what Jed did wrong from a legal standpoint. Once the mine was flooded, Jed had to make a hard choice to save as many of the miners as possible. His hard choice saved a lot of people, but also doomed some, including Alex's dad. We know from there that Jed was recognized as a hero for saving the miners he did, and Typhon set him up at the Black Lantern Bar. My questions are this. What kind of evidence could have been found in the mines that would have condemned Jed or Typhon, and why is Typhon only just now trying to cover up this evidence? It happened 12 years ago, right? Did they not have inspections after the original incident happened? We're told that the inspections are to see if the mine was shut down properly, but you're telling me that no one will notice or care that a detonation occurred in this inactive mine a day or two before inspections? Fishy, fishy. It's also unclear how involved Jed was in Rhea. Did he know Rhea was happening? If he wasn't involved with Rhea, I don't feel comfortable pinning the death of Gabe on Jed. Well, maybe he was involved in covering up Typhon's involvement in Gabe's death. The earliest mention of Jed covering up the crime is at the end of chapter 4. He confirms that he provided pictures of Ryan, Steph, and Alex to scare Alex away from investigating further. And when that didn't work is when he takes Alex to the mines and shoots her. Okay, I feel pretty confident in saying that Jed is a bad guy for shooting her and should go to jail. However, I do not like the ending trying to blame the entirety of Gabe's death on Jed. The entire game has been built on the idea of a corporation using their power to take advantage of people. Typhon should be the main big bad, and ending the game on a showdown with Jed leaves a bad taste in my mouth. In fact, I really liked Diane being set up as the spokesperson for Typhon, the person the game gets to condemn as a way to condemn Typhon. But instead, we are blaming the events of the entire game on a person who, as far as I can tell, wasn't even involved in Gabe's actual death. Am I... Am I an idiot? Am I just missing something really obvious that puts everything into perspective? I'm gonna look at the wiki and see what other people have to say. Well, that didn't clear anything up. Other chapter five thoughts. Although the game has lots of good foreshadowing, something just doesn't feel right with the locket. It's introduced and paid off in the same chapter, and it just doesn't carry as much weight as I would like it to. Finding the locket in the mine is supposed to be the way we figure out that her dad died in the accident 12 years ago. But we as players don't learn about the locket's existence or that her father had it until Alex had already fallen into the mine. I wish they would have found a way to set the locket up earlier in the game. This game seems to want to explore the idea of forgiveness. There's a lot of chances for Alex to offer her forgiveness to characters throughout the story, and I like a lot of it. We offer forgiveness to Ryan in the mountains for his involvement in Gabe's death. We can choose to forgive Mac or not for his, and in the ending, Alex can choose to forgive her dad and also choose to forgive Jed or not. If you've been romancing Ryan but didn't make enough right choices for him to defend you in the final showdown, you have the option to forgive him as well. I understand the exploration of the theme, but I wish they would interrogate it more with certain characters. Mac and Ryan's situation is nuanced enough on its own that I think it makes sense to forgive or not forgive, depending on how you want to interpret it. But in regards to forgiving Jed and her father, it really feels like forgiveness for forgiveness' sake, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but I have a lot of parental trauma, so I always give any story that floats the idea of parental forgiveness the side eye. Her father is dead, so any forgiveness she offers would only be for herself. He didn't earn her forgiveness, and he isn't even able to receive it, but I can understand why she might want to let her hurt go. But offering forgiveness to Jed is wild to me. He tried to kill her earlier that day. Even if we want to explore Jed as a complicated character, it feels weird to ask Alex to forgive Jed there and now. Other parental forgiveness notes. The game never asks us to forgive Alex's mother which feels like the game is removing all guilt from her. 
In the final memory slash dream slash vision, Gabe tells Alex that she was 11 years old and not responsible for keeping her family together. But I feel like the game doesn't recognize how absolutely messed up it was that her mother asked her to do that in the first place. I've had this moment with my mother before, and other eldest daughters in the audience probably know exactly what I'm talking about. I'm glad that Gabe tells Alex and the audience that she isn't responsible. But with the theme of forgiveness, it seems odd for the game to not recognize the mother's faults and have Alex forgive them as well. Once again, not a mistake, just a missed opportunity. Just like the original Life is Strange, you can choose to romance two different characters. But unlike the original, these love interests both seem to be viable. What I mean by that is that Warren in the original game can be romanced, <laughs> but the important choices at the end of the game don't really include him at all. The game is about Chloe and Max's relationship. Whether you make that relationship romantic or not, it is still the core of the story. In True Colors, the game tries so hard to make you see both Ryan and Steph as viable love interests, and the ending gives you options to see your future with either of them. Which is why I was so surprised to see the numbers skewed so heavily in Steph's favor. At first, I assumed this was because Life is Strange had already developed a reputation for being a lesbian game, and thus attracted a lesbian audience. While that is definitely true, I think there is more to it than that. What I didn't know when I first played it is that Steph's first appearance is actually in Before the Storm. Oh god, I didn't think I was gonna have to play another game for this. Psych! This video is too long as it is. <laughs> I did browse through the wiki though, and here's what's relevant. Before the Storm is a prequel game to the original Life is Strange. You play as Chloe going to Blackwell Academy, and a younger Steph is a classmate and friend. Her personality seems to be similar to what it is in True Colors. She's an out and proud lesbian, and she loves to play D&D, even leading the characters in a campaign. But what's more important than what she does in the game is the audience's perception of her. People loved her and were so excited to see her announced as a love interest for True Colors. So a lot of people who had already played Before the Storm were going into this game with a bias towards Steph already. But I've never played Before the Storm. I played True Colors without it. And I think without that added context, Ryan makes more sense as a love interest for Alex. I'm gonna defend my point here, but I wanna make it very clear that I have no problems with anyone playing games however they want. I like Steph and I played her route too. And if you love Steph and don't wanna hear me defend Ryan as best boy, just skip to the time on the screen. Let's start with the endings. Although the game tries to tell you that both love interests are happy to stay or leave, Steph is obviously linked to leaving and Ryan is linked to staying. I remember at the end of chapter two, I said I felt like this was an important line. That home isn't something you find. It's something you build. Something you build. It feels to me that Steph is likely to run from place to place. She wants to be a musician and travel and perform. She wants danger, change, and variety. I think it's possible to interpret home as something you build as home as a person or home is what you make it, but I feel like it means home can be anywhere. Home isn't something you seek out, it finds you or you build it for yourself. Alex has had such an incredibly rough childhood that involved a lot of moving and a lot of instability. Maybe a sure thing, a sure job, a sure home, a sure partner is incredibly valuable to her. Maybe I'm just predicting, because I would die to live in a small mountain town like Haven Springs. The other theme I feel the game is exploring is one of forgiveness, and Ryan fits into that well. In chapter two, we offer him forgiveness for Gabe's death, and your actions with him leading up to chapter five determine whether or not he sides with you against his father. Steph is the only character who always sides with you in that confrontation. Some people see that as a plus, she's loyal, but to me it feels like your actions don't matter. Ryan is more closely linked to the plot, his dad ends up being our villain, and he was there for Gabe's death. It makes sense that he might have trouble accepting such a horrible story about his father right away. Steph's main link to the plot and story is her LARP in Chapter 3, which obviously stemmed from her interest in D&D from Before the Storm. I love the LARP, and it's great for character development and world building, but... Why is it in the game? <laughs> I'm being serious. It takes up at least half a chapter, but it doesn't really tie into the rest of the story or the plot. I was able to skip it almost entirely in my run through. I only talk about it as much as I did because I like it. Steph's main pull with Alex is music. Steph wants to perform and become a star. It's obviously very important to her. In fact, she used to be in a band called Drugstore Makeup. 
One of the items you can find in the world is a pin from her old band. If we use our powers on it, we learn that Steph was dating Izzy, the other member of the band. They broke up when Steph decided to stay in Haven Springs after she was offered a job at the record store instead of going back to Seattle with Izzy. The timeline is a little weird for me because she breaks up with Izzy for the job at the record store, but also we know that Gabe played foosball against her to get her to take the job at the record store instead of moving to Denver. So something is screwy here, but I'm willing to ignore it because I think it's probably just an oversight. If it's not an oversight, then Steph left her relationship and her band for a job at the record store, which she was willing to le like give up to move to Denver just Cause. So, if this wasn't a mistake, I think it makes Steph look way worse. I knew it. I knew this would happen eventually. Fucking... See you around, Steph. But what I think is important to remember is that Steph used to be in a band with someone she was dating, and up and decided to move to a new town, leaving her girlfriend behind. So, that's not amazing news. Steph wants Alex to leave Haven with her and play in a band, but honestly, I'm not convinced Alex wants to be a star. She obviously loves music, but I think music is more of a therapy tool for her. She performs in the Spring Festival, but unwillingly. In fact, we get a pretty clear idea about how she feels the first time she walks into the record store. Standing on stage in front of a crowd of strangers? Fuck creepy crawlies. That's the stuff of nightmares. Before Haven Springs, Alex's guitar seems to be used mostly as a therapy tool, a way to block out the bad things around her. In her dream when we visit the group home, we can see her arguing with some kind of therapist or group home leader about needing her guitar in the dorms. So I'm not 100% convinced that Alex is sold on a music career. We don't really get any specifics about what kind of job Alex would be interested in. So with music being something I mostly saw as Alex doing as a hobby, Steph's best ending has her doing it as a career, which is fine, and I don't think it's impossible for Alex, but it didn't ring as true to me as her staying in Haven and building her life there. So I guess my question is, why is Steph in this game? Music wasn't initially a part of her character in Before the Storm, that I can tell. Like I said, I haven't played the game. Steph's stronger character trait there was her love of D&D, &D, which we see expressed in the LARP, but it's not necessary to the plot. My tinfoil hat theory here is that Steph wasn't originally meant to be in this game, but she got such a good reception in Before the Storm, they decided to find a way to make her work as the female love interest for True Colors. This is based on literally nothing, but I'm going to choose to believe it. And Steph deserves better. She deserves to be a love interest in a game tailored for her. But if you love Steph and think she's the best partner for Alex, or have no interest in Ryan, that's fine. There's no accounting for taste. Even though I'm not the biggest fan of chapter five of the game, I still really like True Colors and I would absolutely recommend it to any fan of the first. Seriously, I know I just ran you through the plot, but still go play it. There's so much else there I didn't talk about. I could probably make a video double this length, but this has already taken me like six months. I think the best path for Alex is to stay in Haven Springs and date Ryan, but please feel free to prove me wrong in the comments. Should I talk about any other Life is Strange games or any other games for that matter? This has been my first video essay and it took me way too long. I'm definitely gonna have to change my process here so you don't have to wait forever for the next video. But while you're waiting, maybe give this video a like and a subscribe. You could be one of the first 100. And check out Camp Palette. That would really help me out a lot. I worked hard on it and I'm really proud of it. Some of the interstitial music you've been hearing in this video is actually from Camp Palette, composed by the lovely Biz. You can check out her SoundCloud for more of her music also below. Thanks for watching this far and until next time, see ya. Delicious, bedazzled, kiwi snobs. It's apple pucker. What do you, as a psychologist, have to say about implying that trauma causes superpowers? And that would be kick-ass if it happened that way.